Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Ultra Mega Number one. Now let me tell you something. Let's just be honest. First of all, this is a very light week in comic books. Not so much really stood out to me, but Ultra Mega really did. It's $7.99, but it's got a lot of content, a lot of pages. This is definitely a must read if you're a kaiju fan, if you like Ultraman. It's kind of like that whole idea of Ultraman and, and kaiju monsters kind of thrown in a really wacky, wonky situation. It's got insane action scenes. So it's written and illustrated by James Heron with artwork by Dave, with a coloring by Dave Stewart. This book has got some really cool, grotesque monster designs. It's got some great action. It's got some resonating, deep, tragically emotional and human moments in it as well. So I thought that this was really, really solid. Even if you weren't already a Kaiju fan or an Ultraman fan, I would encourage you to pick this up, especially if you got a light pull this week like I did. Definitely worth checking out. And if you are a Kaiju fan, it's pretty much a must read. So pick of the week is Ultra Mega number one. That's from Image Comics. Also from Image Comics this week, we've got the second issue of Radiant Black. Now Radiant Black is Kyle Higgins's um, attempt to do a creator-owned superhero. You know, he made a name for himself doing work on We're at Batman. He made a name for himself reimagining and redefining what it means to tell a Power Rangers story with the creation of Lord Draken and whatnot. Radiant Black is a brand new creation from him. He's just this average guy. He's a writer who has just hadn't had any luck yet. So he's got, he's in the tons of debt and he winds up having to go back home and live with his parents. And so he's dealing with all that embarrassment and all that, that sense of failure. And that's like easy, like just oozing through the page. Like the relatability of the character is very strong. But now we're getting into some real cool superheroic type stuff. I really did like the first issue, but I thought it was a little too basic as far as the superhero origin goes. But now we're starting to hit some stride. Now we're starting to get momentum building in this book. There's some great little nuanced scenes in here between the father and the main character, him and his friend. And then the superhero stuff is great. And Marcelo Costa's artwork is just awesome. It's sleek, it's simple, it's got room to breathe, and it just... just smoothly glides across the page. Radiant Black number two, pretty freaking solid. And I got Noctera number one here. Now we've already covered Noctera, but I just want to say that this is a glow in the dark cover. So that's pretty badass. Okay, let's jump over to Marvel. We got Black Knight, Curse of the Ebony Blade. Um, it was all right. I mean, it's written by Simon Spurrier, and Spurrier's been doing some really, really solid work lately, so I wanted to give this a shot. I've never been that big of a fan of Dane Whitman, of the Black Knight, of, of all that kind of stuff over at Marvel. So when he did the... So this kind of doesn't really necessarily super spin out of the King and Black, Black Knight one shot, but it is kind of the same writer, obviously, and so it's it's picking up some of these elements. Um, and the idea is that, you know, he's got the ebony blade and it only works when like you're like, you got like evil in your heart, malicious intent, right? So he's a hero who's using a weapon that's powered by evil. And so he has to use evil for good and this and that. They get a little jokey with the character, a little bit overly so. This is a, this is a move that they make with a lot of heroes lately. And it's just not something that really, I don't know, resonated with me for the character Black Knight. I just didn't really like this one. It has some cool ideas. It has some intriguing concepts. But overall, it was kind of... Kind of a dud for me. Then we got Thor number 13. 13 issues of Thor and Donny Cates has just been killing it. We are now hitting the penultimate issue of this Prey storyline in which Donald Blake has broken free and has now got the power of the Midgard Serpent and he's just tearing ass through Asgard, Midgard, whatever guard you want to name. He's just wrecking it. And now we got Odin being thrown back into it. Big, weighty action, great big moments, bombastic natured stuff. Really loving Thor right now. Nick Klein's artwork is super solid. I really feel like he's coming into his own more and more, especially anchored by the coloring from Matt Wilson. Matt Wilson's ability to do different styles of coloring depending on what the tone and atmosphere of the book is supposed to be is absolutely astounding. Thor number 13 did not disappoint. We got a King and Black Spider-Man tie-in. This is just a one-shot. Completely irrelevant 
irrelevant to the ongoing story of Spider-Man, completely irrelevant to the ongoing story in King and Black. But it was one of the best Spider-Man issues I've read in a long time. It had great artwork. It was fun. Uh, Spider-Man seemed like he was, you know, really Peter Parker. Um, he had jokes, but he also had carrying this big burden. Now, you can imagine what Peter feels in King and Black. Like, this is all stuff that's that's basically happening because he brought the, the Venom symbiote to Earth, right? So you know the Parker luck and you know the Parker guilt. So he's dealing with that here. Like I said, it's nothing extraordinary, but it was a nice, fun, well-rounded Spider-Man comic book. And fans of the channel know that I have found that to be severely lacking over at Marvel Comics lately. Then we get X-Force number 18. Benjamin Percy's just killing it on this book, especially this new arc in which he's really focusing in on Quentin Quire. There is this psionic unknown threat that's developing around the edges of Krakoa and and it's taking everybody by surprise is it somehow related to Quentin is it somehow related to Quentin's memory lapses in between resurrection protocols and he's got missing time what's going on people are taking their abilities away from them weaponizing it we've seen it with Domino what's going on with Kid Omega what I really like about this though is that they're doing some really amazing work with the character of Quentin if you look at that character from his very first appearance in the Grant Morrison New X-Men days from back in the early 2000s into what is happening in the pages of X-Force. It is an extraordinary tale and story arc of a character um, still dealing with all the pain and hurt that caused him to come out as a villainous uh, character at first, but now he's taking this more heroic stance. He's feeling more accepted, um, but now he's also dealing with almost a personified doubt within himself. It's just really cool stuff and liking it. We got a very uh, variant artist, I almost said. We got an alternative artist here, a fill-in artist, and it's all right. The art's not as solid as Kassar's work typically is, but X-Force 18 was extremely excellent. <laughs> anyway, then we got Captain America. This is an 80th anniversary tribute special, so this is just like the giant size X-Men one they did. This is basically a retelling of Captain America Comics number one and Avengers number four. Is it four or five? It's four. Robbie, you were right. Never doubt yourself, people. Um, anyway, so it's a retelling of those uh, word for word, panel by panel, but each panel is done by a different artist. So you've got tons of different people, Declan Shalvey, Alex Ross, and they're just redoing it, right? So this, they're just redoing it, a different artist on each page. It's a cool idea, but the book itself kind of comes across as clunky, but like I said, it's it's kind of nifty. Let's jump over to DC. Justice League is here with issue number 59. I know that a lot of us are really worried about what Bendis is going to be doing on this title, but in the first issue, I was rather, rather shocked and surprised at how well I thought this was done. Um, it doesn't do a lot in the first issue, but it does do just enough, building up the idea of how's Naomi going to wind up being involved in the Justice League? How does Black Adam get involved? And there's some really great moments in between Superman and Black Adam that like show that they have this relatableness, but there's always been something kind of getting in that way. That being said, David Marquez's artwork is just striking. It's great. I liked the story. I really liked the setup. You only get 20 pages of the Bendis story, but you do get 10 pages of Rom V and Sir Monaco doing Justice League Dark. And it was this really crazily dark and deliberate, just 10 page opener for what Rom V's next big opus is going to be with Justice League Dark. So it sucks that Justice League Dark is no longer its own title, that it's the backup story in Justice League, but a third of this comic is Rom V's Justice League, and it was awesome, Justice League Dark, I should say. Really great work in there, so I liked this issue. So far, Infinite Frontier has been giving me revitalization. It's been giving me a fresh burst of energy, creative output from DC Comics, and I'm really digging it. We got an anthology, Superman Red and Blue, number one. This is a $5.99 book, but it's got like four or five different stories in it. Some of them are super, super strong. There's a John Ridley story that ties into some old school world's finest books, and I love when they tie into things. Remember, now we're post, you know, post death metal. Everything counts. Everything happened. Um, but this is basically like Batman black and white. Great top-notch creators doing uh, little tiny stories involving the Man of Steel, but all they're using is red and blue. Instead of black and white, like the Batman one, it's all red and blue. The artwork in the book is absolutely amazing all the way through. You got some pretty solid stories. That Ridley story is great. Uh, Marguerite Bennett's got a great story in here, but Dan Waters, and Danny, 
the exact same creative team from Coffinbound, one of my favorite comics of the last two years, they did a Superman story that was so freaking resonating. I almost considered having this be the pick of the week just because of that one story, because I do think that one story is worth the price of admission alone. Also, there's a Wes Craig story in here, the cat that does Deadly Class. That was a pretty freaking fun one, too, but I'm serious. The Dan Waters Danny story, even if you don't go buy this, just, like, go to your shop and just flip and, and just read that one story. But, man, you got some... That's the Wes Craig stuff right there. Poof, magnifique. Then we got Nightwing number 78 here. This is the start of the Tom Taylor Bruno Rondondo run. This is the exact same creative team from the previous volume of Suicide Squad, which was very stylistic, um, had a nice, like... Uh, action-y energy, like a heist movie type thing, very cool and sleek, and they're bringing that aesthetic right into Nightwing. This felt like such a throwback to the Chuck Dixon, Scott McDaniel days. It felt like everything that makes this character work was just on perfect display. It's got a lot of similarities to Matt Fraction's Hawkeye run, at least in the first issue set up, but I really liked it. Tom Taylor's got the voice of the character down. He understands what sets apart Nightwing from Batman, Bloodhaven, um, from Gotham, and he's setting up a new journey for Dick Grayson that's really interesting, and I'm kind of like into it, right? A new direction, but it's also got its roots um, tied firmly into what's come before. Tom Taylor also, like usual, can give us great action, great comedy, and then all out of nowhere just hit you in the gut with an emotional punch, and he does it in Nightwing 78, an excellent issue. Best issue of Nightwing I've read in maybe decades. Catwoman is here with issue number 29, written by Rom V. This book is awesome. Now that Future State is done, Rom can get back to what he was doing with Catwoman, which is telling lighter stories than he typically does on books like, say, Justice League Dark, or his creator-owned work like Blue and Green, or The Savage Shores, or the upcoming Radio Apocalypse, or The Many Deaths of Layla Star. By the way, I've read that one. That's Oh, don't tell anybody I read it, but it's awesome. Um, Catwoman number 29 is great, and what's happening now, the book may seem deceptively simple and as not as layered as some of those other works we mentioned, but that's that's an illusion. It's all there, but it's in a different kind of way. The character work that's being done with Selena is very, very subtle, and if you pay attention to it, you start seeing the subtlety of it and everything that's been built up to. I'm really digging what Ron B's doing just in general, and especially in the pages of Catwoman. He's really taken the character Selena and really has done something to really, I don't know, he would make Darwin Cook and Ed Brubaker and them proud, and that was like the best Catwoman book I ever read. Catwoman 29, pretty freaking solid. Then we got Truth and Justice. Um, this is another little one-shot. It's a series of one-shots. This one's about Superman. They usually deal with a DC character trying to fight social justice for some, for so, social justice or something like that. And this one was all right. It wasn't bad. Brandon Easton's the writer. It's got decent artwork. It's a decent Superman story, a bit preachy at times. But aside from that, it was pretty solid. Let's jump over to some indies. From Dark Horse, we have Orphan and the Five Beasts. This is the first part of a new miniseries written and illustrated by James Stokoe. James Stokoe is one of my favorite artists in the industry. He's got this really densely intricate and complex and detailed style that I just could look at for hours and hours and hours. The artwork on this book is great. It's got a nice sense of flow. It's got some really interesting, cool ideas, great layouts and composition. The problem is that the story itself with the pacing and the, the narrative and the dialogue, it feels a bit clunky, a bit stilted at times. But overall, like I said, I could just look at this artwork forever. This book is not going to change your life, but if you're not familiar with Stokoe's work, I would highly encourage you to check this one out just to see the amazing beauty that he can do on the comic book page. Orphan and the Five Beasts from Dark Horse Comics this week. From Vault, we've got I Walk With Monsters issue number four, a very breezy issue. This took no time to read whatsoever, but it does have a little bit of an emotional punch to it. So right now we're still learning a lot more about these two characters, what's going on, how can this dude turn into a crazy monster, how did he meet this little young lady, how do they wind up on this path of vengeance against people who have terrorized um, small children and stuff like that, and how does it relate to this politician that they're hunting down. So it's really got a deliberate yet slow build, but the issues themselves just breeze right on through. I'm loving the artwork by Cantorino. Paul Cornwell does a great job of having the script not feel heavy, feel very free, weightless almost, but still have it anchored in with the stories 
and the characters, and it's the characterization that's really um, moving this story forward, and I'm excited to see where it's going to go. I Walk With Monsters number four out this week. Then we have Abbott 1973, issue number three from Boom Studios. That's my cover of the week right there. Just love that love it. Like, if I'm walking through the comic shop, this is going to be the one I see across the room and I'm going to go check out first. Abbott is great. This is a sequel, of course, to the original Abbott series. It's about an African-American journalist in Detroit in the 70s. In fact, in particular, 1973, it's got a supernatural tinge to it. She is the light bringer, so she's fighting these demons and they're getting involved in her own personal life. And then you got the political stuff that she's trying to um, do her journalistic stuff on. Everything is just all these different layers coming around, doing a great job with it. Saladin Ahmed is the writer. We got Sammy Cavella as the artist. The composition is impeccable. The line work is simple and clean, but it's very effective. Abbott 1973, number three out this week. Oryx number two is here. Um, I really didn't dig this one. I thought the first one was okay, but I didn't know if I was going to read the second one, but it was a light week, so I read it. The book has got a charm to it. It's kind of, it's an all ages tale um, about these orcs and they're like the orc kids and it's got this nice kind of vibe to it, but it just feels there's something that's off about it. The artwork is cool. The flow of the artwork is cool, but there's something about the dialogue. There's something about the pacing of that that's throwing me off when I'm reading this. It makes it feel overly long, even though at times you go through 10 pages in just like 10 seconds because it does have some great artwork. The story itself, though, it's not really grabbing me. I'm not the biggest fantasy guy. I know other people are. So if you are and you like silly, fun orc stuff, maybe check this one out. It's very light. It's not super serious. It's goofy. It's funny, but it is a bit charming. Orcs number two. That will probably be my last. Then we have The Bequest. Issue number one. This is from Aftershocks, written by Tim Seeley, with artwork by Freddie E. Williams II. Um, I didn't really like this one. Once again, it's a fantasy type set book, so it's very D&D-esque. In fact, it even has at the end of the book, like, character sheets for the characters. So I guess if you wanted to role play them, I don't know how that works. Role play is something completely different to me, if you know what I'm saying. But the bequest was all right. It was kind of confusing at first. It really does kind of come together towards the end when you really get the gist of the book and the premise and what it's going to be about. Um, basically, you got this magical realm and you have Earth and there's like the, 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 let's just say the, the wall between the worlds is starting to weaken. So Earth has protectors that are supposed to pr keep the magic out of Earth. And one interesting concept is that magic is slowly leaking away from this magical world into Earth. And there's a balance they have to maintain. So it's got some interesting ideas, but it wasn't really quite ideas that I get that much into. So I thought it was just kind of okay. I don't usually vibe with a lot of Tim Seeley work. So this is probably just a one and done for me. But that is out from Aftershock. Speaking of Aftershock, Maniac from New York or of, Maniac of New York. Um, issue number two, this came out last week, but because of the fiasco of me not getting my comics, I didn't read it until this week, so I just want to tell you, I loved it. I loved it. I thought that the first issue had a lot of exposition, so does this one, but this one, it deals with it in a much more deliberate method, right? So you got some terrible murder going on on many pages and then the, on other pages you're getting the exposition and you're getting them through the police interviews and things like that if you don't know maniac of the new york maniac of new york is basically what if jason Voorhees still was around they never caught him they kept making them this is basically friday the 13th part 83 okay maniac of new york though came out last week most of y'all probably already read that i loved it erratic number four from AWA Upshot, this is the penultimate issue, so only one more to go. I'm really digging this. I think Kara Andrews is really doing a great job of giving us a nice, fun, vibrant, youthful, um, young person-oriented superhero book. And it's kind of got some Spider-Man vibes, but it's also got its own identity, its own unique voice. It's got a great sense of flow and style. Kara Andrews is a great artist. He's adapting his style differently to make it work for this story, for this character. It's tied in and connected to the whole Resistance Reborns JM, JMS stuff, but you don't have to read any of that. The character work's being done in this issue is pretty freaking phenomenal as well. Erratic, number four. Really liking it. They Fell From the Sky, number two. So this is a Mad Cave book, and it's about this kid. He's obsessed with, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the show. It's the fictional show in here, but it's based on Star Trek. So he's a big Star Trek nerd. And then one day, the ship crash lands, and this cute little, like, 
not quite puppy looking thing, but this cute little alien shows up and now he's trying to befriend the alien in a very E.T. type way. Obviously, this is an E.T. reference um, in the story, in the concept, on the cover. They know what they're doing, but they're doing something a little bit different with it. And I thought the first issue was a pretty cool, interesting setup, but the second issue really, really hooked me in. Um, it's freaking cute. It's adorable. It's got a sense of danger. It's got a sense of mystery. And all in all, They Fell from the Sky was a hell of a tribute to E.T. and other films like that. And it definitely still does its own thing. They Fell from the Sky, number two, out this week. Then we've got Horror Comics, black and white, number one. This is from Antarctic Press. Um... It was a light week, so I said, let's pick this up. This book was garbage. It was trash. I did not like it. Some of the artwork in it was interesting, but all the stories were dumb. They felt very amateurish, and just like there wasn't a lot of, like, I don't know who edited this book, but, like, it just, y'all, you know, this was whack. I just didn't like that, so I don't want to go on about it too much. Then we have another Storyteller series from Jim Henson's um, Storyteller. This is Trickster, so this is talking about, oh, what's the name? And Anasi or something, the, uh, the the spider trickster god. So this is giving us those African legends and mythology. Um, and it's all right. Usually with these storytellers, and they've done ghosts, they've done witches, they've done so many different things. Usually, the first issues are the best, and then they get weaker as they progress. They're all going to be their own story by a completely different writer and artist. Um, but this one was just okay. It had some decent artwork. The story, though, never really quite hooked me in, and it's really based on some really direct mythology, so... I think it could have done a better job of evoking an emotion, at least for me, maybe not for you. Jim Henson's The Storytellers, Tricksters, number one, out this week. And finally, let's talk about it. Count is here. So you know that we had Ibrahim Mustafa on the show last Thursday for Rock and Robbie Live. It was a great conversation. Me and Brian had a hell of a time with him. This is the book we were talking about. It is here. This is a sci-fi reimagining of the Count of Monte Cristo, completely illustrated and written by who else? Ibrahim Mustafa. Super cool cat, and I'm loving it. It also has coloring by Brad Simpson and lettering by Hassan Ansman El Howe. That's a hell of a team. This is a great book. If you have any kind of a affinity to the Count of Monte Cristo, whether it's the book or whether it's the movie, which for me, it's the movie with Guy Pierce. I, I freaking love that movie. Um, but Count's pretty solid. I really like it. And in fact, if it wouldn't make so many people upset, I probably would have made it my pick of the week, but I didn't want you, I didn't want you to think nepotism was involved. But seriously, this is a really solid book. The artwork by Ibrahim is just so solid, solidly rendered, expertly executed. The coloring's there, and like I said on that show, I don't know many people that can convey a sense of motion and action quite as well as Ibrahim does in the pages of his other works, but especially Count. Great, fun, sci-fi action adventure. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, subscribe, click the notification bell so you don't miss a single video, and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.